Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join real estate entrepreneur and mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Austin Linney. All right, guys, welcome to Construct Your Life. Uh, We've got a special guest here today, uh, Christopher Grinswick. If I said that right, I apologize. Probably not. I'm dyslexic, so (laughs) (laughs) it's my scariest part of the whole interview. The rest of the stuff's easy. Uh, (laughs) We've got an interesting story here, man. I've followed this guy on social media for a little bit. We actually are meeting in Zoom, whatever you want to call it, for the first time, so we've never even met. So like I said on my podcast, I I don't... I know a little bit about him. I don't do much. We're going to let him tell his story on uh, how he went from a a, a soccer coach and cold calling stocks to uh, having a massive portfolio north of, you know, $300 million of multifamily assets. Mm -hmm. Um, The content he puts out is fantastic. So we're going to have a great podcast here and welcome to the show, bud. Uh, Why don't you tell us your story and, and we'll kind of get rolling. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you for having me on. Uh, you were very close on the name. Uh, last name's Grenzig. Um, I go by Chris, not Christopher, but no okay. sweat. Only, only, uh, only my mom and my Oma call me Christopher. So um, you can if you want, but no. it's all good. Um, but yeah, my, my story and where I typically start, um, you know, I'm born and raised in New York on Long Island. Um, I went to school at Hofstra University for college uh, from 2010 to 2014. Uh, I was a Division One student athlete playing soccer. And like a lot of student athletes and kids at that age just had no idea what I was going to do. Didn't really have a plan in place. Um, you know, at the, uh, probably the, my mom wasn't too, uh, big of a fan of that. Let's just say, (laughs) um, probably gave her a couple extra gray hairs because of that. So, um, but luckily enough, I have some pretty amazing friends hooked me up with a division two coaching job up in Massachusetts, uh, in Worcester specifically at Assumption college and moved up there decided to give that a try because I love the sport. Um, I had coached youth soccer for many, many years and greatly enjoyed it. Worked with kids all my life. So it was just kind of a natural segue. Um, Went up there for a year, tried it. Absolutely loved college coaching, um, but there were some major flaws in it that I took a step back from and decided to change. Um, One, the pay is absolutely atrocious unless you're at a bigger school um, that's full-time or eventually you get into you know, a professional coaching job Two, um, I really missed being home. Um, it was the first year I'd spent away and, you know, I was definitely homesick to a certain degree, but it was, you know, family, friends, everything that I knew and loved was in New York besides my sister. Um, she had moved to Florida by that point, but wanted to move back. And three, I just saw the writing on the wall that, you know, if I wanted to scale up and progress quickly in this field, uh, I would have to be doing youth coaching for a long, long time, and I didn't want to do that or work several jobs. Uh, and I would have to be willing to move basically anywhere and everywhere in the country uh, when it, you know, demanded, you know, to move up into bigger programs, into you know, head coaching roles and things like that. So, because of those reasons, I decided to shift. Uh, got another coaching job back on Long Island at Queens College. Did that for a year and a half, and then also on the side, instead of getting another coaching job decided to work for a stock brokerage company, like you mentioned. Uh, I applied for tons of jobs. I mean, you know, as low as, you know, Starbucks and, you know, McDonald's and things like that, uh, because I needed income. And for some reason, these guys gave me a shot. So it was good. Um, but it was brutal. It was, you know, first coming in, it was your first day, they would like run you through some cold calling scenarios. And then they told you to pick up the phone and just start calling people. And, you know, you learn very quickly to get over your embarrassment, uh, and you just start doing, and it was great. It taught me a lot. Um, also though, I knew it also wasn't for me. Uh, the misalignment of values was just there. Um, it was very much what can I make off my clients and not what can I make my clients, which I feel is not the way it should be when you're in the investment space and you're utilizing other people's money or you're investing on the behalf of other people. So for me, it just didn't sit right. Um, kind of came to a point where about, uh, I got licensed in January of 2016, which is coincidentally when I first learned about real estate, but 
a month or two into it, when I got licensed, my aunt called me and said, Hey, you know, I know you just got licensed. Would it be helpful if I transferred my like retirement account over to you? And I knew right away the answer was no, because I didn't trust that my company would allow me to do the things that I thought would be smart for her and her retirement. And once that hit, I was like, okay, that's it. Like I knew this was it, but this was the, you know, the final nail. So luckily at that time, as I mentioned, uh, January of 2016, I got licensed. And that was also when um, my mom, and my cousin bought a flipping course. Uh, they dragged me along to the weekend immersion seminar. Um, and that was my first introduction into real estate. The example I always give was I used to think asbestos was a type of mold. And so I literally knew nothing. I had rented a house my senior year of college and I grew up living in a house. Um, that was my total exposure. So it was the next couple months, nights and weekends, really learning as much as I could, as quick as I could, uh, you know, through podcasts, videos, the, you know, the course that we had bought as well as leaning on my mom and my cousin who were both agents and had done some other stuff. So quick learning curve. And then for the next several months, just failed to flip a single home, uh, in the Long Island area. Um, you know, we tried for, you know, several months and just really couldn't put anything together. Um, it was two major reasons. Um, one larger than the other. The first reason is the course we used was based on quick calculations for renovation dollars by square footage. And it probably worked great for most parts of the country. High cost of living areas wasn't really suited for that. Um, however, I say, you know, that's not really the major excuse. The major reason, or I should say reason, not excuse. It's an excuse really. But the major reason was just a lack of execution. You know, we only did it for several months we could have easily taken those systems and applied it to, you know, our area, learned all the new pricing, learned all the new strategies and changed it around. Um, however, we decided to, instead of trying to make it work on our own, um, find, buddy, find somebody with a little bit more experience and partner with them. So we ended up lending money to a decently experienced flipper in Pennsylvania and his cousin ended up being... John Cohen, who's one of the owners for the company I work for now. Um, so met John, uh, they were going to teach us how to buy, uh, properties at auction that were tax deeds down in Philadelphia. Cause we thought that would be interesting, you know, buying homes for pennies on the dollars, flip them. And you know, you got them in a really good area. My cousin and I drove down, drove 50, 60, 70 houses quickly realized wasn't for us. It was just super rough. It was going to take a ton of time. You know, it's two and a half, three hour drive each way. Um, or you'd have to stay over. Um, he was already working two jobs. He was about to have his first kid or just had his first kid. Um, my mom had no desire to drive back and forth. So I knew it was going to fall on me. And I was just like, this isn't going to work out. So came back um, and kind of regrouped. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, That's okay. And was sitting down with John and he was raising money for this little eight unit in Covington, Kentucky. And we had just started hearing about multifamily. So we thought it was really interesting and decided to do the same thing as we did with the flip, invest passively and just pick his brain. So started jumping on phone calls, getting coffee, you know, once a week, every other week for like a month or two. And just very quickly realized that had a lot of same values, really good synergies, you know, just got on really well and asked him if, you know, he would be interested in, you know, letting us be a part of the, the general partnership or joint venture on a deal and, you know, take some of the workload off his plate. He said, sure. Um, so we ended up buying another 17 units in the same area. Uh, instead of being a passive investor, we were on the general partnership for those. And then we also joint ventured on an 82 unit deal down in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, and then while we were doing that 17 unit, um, I was still working as a stockbroker and absolutely hated it and was ready to quit with nothing else lined up. I'd stayed on like an extra two, three months just to try to find something else I can do. So while I'm doing all this, I'm trying to find new jobs as well. And just as luck would have it, sitting down with John one day by myself. And as we were talking, just telling him more about what I'm doing and how I'm thinking of quitting, a name popped up and he had actually worked for the same people I was working for about five, six years prior. So he got it. And just as we were talking, he just said, Hey, look, why don't you come work for me and my partner? it's probably a little too early for us, but we'll bring you on as like a trial period. You know, we'll pay you a little bit, but at least it, you know, 
worst case scenario, you get a little bit more experience, you make a little bit of money, you, know, you get out of your job, you can throw it on your resume and we'll see what happens. And I said, sure. So I sat down with John and his partner, Don, um, and decided to move over full time in August, 2016. Uh, and I've been there ever since. So we're coming up on almost four years now. And you know, it's funny and I'd love to meet your partner one day because yeah. th- in our businesses that we have the three or four businesses that we have that are the fourth one is about to launch. A lot of those businesses are too early in the process as well to bring on the talent. But what I realized is that in order for us to scale, in order for me to make sure that I'm in the role that I need to be in, I had to bring on people like earlier than I thought because, you know, I read a book and it's like, dude, when you find the talent, like you've got to grab them and you mm-hmm. got to hold on to them. So I would imagine that's crazy that y'all never met and you worked at the same company. Cause that mm-hmm. synergy to that, like he knew exactly how you were feeling. He's like, I'm going to give this, this guy a shot. And then here we are now. And you know, y'all are crushing it. And, but I would imagine like in the process, like my two questions are, how did you have money to invest in deals? Mm-hmm. Was it from your job? The second question is, is like, everybody always asks me all the time, like, how did you make that decision that like, you know, there's a lot of people that would have stayed at the coaching job. There's a lot yep. of people that would have stayed at the stockbroker job, right? How did you say like, how did you burn the boats and say like, I don't know where this is going to go, mm-hmm. but I'm going to sure give it a shot because I'm that type of guy too. Like, I'm just going to go for it. And like, I just got laid off like a month ago. And like, for the first time in my life at 38 years old, I'm betting on myself mm-hmm. and it feels amazing. I mean, it's really hard to describe. That's I mean, awesome. we, we have like, minus neg- revenue right now, but who cares? <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like exactly. the Airbnb world is like literally destroyed, but yeah. like, that's okay though. And so like, I guess that's where I want to go with, cause this sure. shows a lot about mindset, lifestyle yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff like that. And we'll talk about real estate too, but. Like, no, so I think, make- I think those early years are interesting. And as you were talking, I kept moving where I was going to start the timeline further and further <laughs> back. Um, I think one thing that I do that I like is oftentimes, not always because I get lazy and I procrastinate, but oftentimes when I make decisions and bigger decisions, I try to think about what Chris in one year, two years, five years now would look back on and say, Hey, I'm happy I did that. Hey, I'm happy. You know, I made that decision and I try to reverse engineer what that would be. So the first time I ever really saw that play out was my going into my senior year of college. Um, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't like a suit, you know, I had a little bit of scholarship money for playing. Um, but I wasn't like a, you know, a big recruit, you know, I barely played my first two years. I played a little bit my junior year and, you know, right. You know, if you're not playing by then, you're not going pro, you're not really doing anything. Um, so I kind of saw the writing on the wall. I was like, yeah, this is it. Like it's, you know, you've been sitting on the bench for basically three years now, you're going to do something about it or not. So that summer, me and a few of my buddies, we rented a house. We did a year long lease. So instead of going home for the summer, I said, mom, dad, I love you. I'll still see you, but I'm staying here for the summer and I'm just training. Like that's it. So spent that whole summer, three days eating super clean, barely drank, you know, maybe a couple times that summer. And you know, when we were at school, you know, we would drink several times a week. So it was like a drastic cutback and just trained a ton. Um, and At the time, you know, I dropped like 10 pounds over the summer, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're already an athlete, like we had to run three miles in 17, 30 minutes. So like Mm -hmm. already a pretty decent athlete, that's a, you know, a good amount of weight to shed. And it was like, came into that preseason and just a lot of different benchmarks. I just jumped up significantly from other people. Um, and like that year, you know, I didn't become a bona fide starter, but I think I started like half or three quarters of the games played in almost every single one. So it was, if I had done that earlier, I think it would have led to more, but it was like, okay, it was like, put your head to the grindstone for two, three months and let's see what happens. And the results were just very visceral. So once I saw that, that was like leading to that process of like, okay, what are we going to do now? slowly but surely every day so that we'll see the effects in the long term. And that's kind of how I was saying, like, that's how I started to think about things like, okay, let's do it in the future. Let's think about going forward. So when you ask, how did you make that decision to leave the coaching job? It was, I took a long, hard look and said, okay, if I want to be 
in this coaching world, here's what I've got to do. Cause I was making $5,000 a year ah. as that's the coaching job. I got, I got free, I got free housing on campus as well, but you're, I, so, you're, you're, so, you're fucking with me, right? No, no, I, I promise you. I'll show you my tax returns for the first years out of college. I was below the poverty line. Oh shit. <laughs> I promise you. I swear to you. My mom couldn't believe it. I would file my taxes. I would Dude, what it, did, you gotta, so, you gotta humor me. What is that a month? I don't know. What's 5,000 divided by What's it like 6,000 would be 500 bucks. So, <laughs> but that's my point. So, but it's considered a part-time role. So I took on a part-time role knowing that I would have to go get other jobs. So like I didn't make $5,000 for the year. I think I made like 20 or 25 or something like that yeah. um, on paper. And, but that's because I coached youth soccer. I did tournaments, um, you know, over the summer as a coach, they do a ton of like, camps and stuff for college kids and you get paid pretty well there. So you can make good money as a college coach, but you know, you're working tons of hours. You're going to work 40 plus hours and you're going to work seven days a week and you're going to work during the quote unquote best times of the year. So summer, forget about it. Your tournaments and camps and stuff like that. Um, you know, your time off is really kind of like the winters. Um, and then, you know, fall and spring, you're working seven days a week as well. You know, Saturdays and Sundays, you're youth coaching or, you know, you've got games for college. So I saw that. I was like, I'm going to work more than a lot of jobs. I'm going to make next to nothing now, unless I like start my own camp or, you know, do these different things, which I thought about. But I said, like, I want to go back to New York, but ultimately I want to be the head coach of a program. Like that was, if this is what I'm doing, that's what I want to do. I don't want to be an assistant. You know, I wanted to, you know, build a program, find somewhere I like, then build a program. That was like, if I'm going to do this, that's what I want. But I was like, I also want to be in New York. And I thought about it and there was like, there's like less than 10, I think there's like five or six division one schools. And there's like another five or six division two. I was like, I wanted to do B division one if I could, but I would do division two just because of the rules and, you know, the money and, you know, the size of the programs and things like that. And I was like, you know, it's hard enough to scale up to that role anywhere in the country itself quickly, but now I'm going to constrain myself to, you know, 1% of the total schools in the country. Um, I just said, you know, for me, living where I wanted to live was more important than that job. Um, so I just kind of said, look, I can do this, but I don't want to move down to Florida. I don't want to move to West Virginia. I don't want to move to Louisiana to go into these schools because I'm not going to, you know, Worcester is a nice little city. Like it's a mini kind of, I don't want to say mini Brooklyn, I'll say kind of, um, like it's a nice little city. Like it's got cool stuff. It's got, you know, the, the bars, the coffee shops and everything. Like it's a nice little, t- it's like, a, it's a mini Boston, let's say that. Mm-hmm. And it's close to Boston. It's close to New York. It wasn't too far from home. I was like, you know, if I'm going to move somewhere else in the country, it's definitely not going to be as good as this. So I just kind of saw the writing on the wall and I just took a step back and I said, you've got to understand what this means for you in the future and does it fit with what you want? And ultimately being back in New York close to my family and friends was more important than that future job outlook, basically. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's when you said it earlier, you're sitting on that bench for three years. What I was thinking about the whole time was metaphorically, not only were you sitting on the bench for your soccer team, you were sitting on the bench for life. Yeah. You know, and you weren't, you weren't fully in, you know, and as you're talking the whole time, all I'm thinking about is that, that Chris is going out to construct his life with multifamily investing. So in 10, 15 years, you can go coach for the next 20 years of your life. That's, I literally feel, and I'm not saying you, I've never, I've never thought of doing that. I but think that I think that, it's a, that, thought, that thought honestly never occurred to me, but it's actually interesting. I, I think I enjoy this too much now that I wouldn't go back to coaching. If it was your um, kid, you would get fulfillment. I, I could out of see, it. I could, I could definitely see coaching my, you know, my kids in the future for sure. Whether it's, you know, whether I'm financially free or not, you know, I would think that's something I would make the time for regardless. And then it would be um, pure passion and not yeah. just, you know, like, oh, I got to do this. Right. No, but it's a good point. Right. If it's something you, really, really enjoy it. There's other aspects of it too that, you know, I wasn't, I played about. soccer. I loved it. I played every, I, I played I loved, every position. Yeah. Yeah. I love the game, but coaching, I mean, you, you've got some really high it's, highs. Dude, I respect, really, really I respected lows, those guys because so. those dudes grind. <laughs> like yeah. it's uh, it's so, a, it's yeah. interesting. I'd never actually thought of that. So I'm definitely over the next, 
several years, maybe a couple decades, that's now going to start percolating in the back <laughs> of my mind of like, Hey, get set up and you can yeah. just, you know, if yeah. you want to coach a program, you can, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's something that just feels right in my heart right now. And I'm not mm-hmm. saying it'll ever happen, but it's interesting thought. You know, one of the things that turned me on to, and we'll start continuing with the story of sure. uh, your company. The, the thing that was like, holy crap, when I saw it was, you know, and I don't quote me cause I, I don't hundred percent remember. Did you say that your company walked away from a 50,000 or $500,000 earnest money yeah. one time? That yeah, was like grand. the, how much? 500. That was like the, holy, what the F? Like, cause so, a lot of people would have kept going forward. So, yeah. So we, we were under contract. So about two, what happened was about two and a half years ago, prior to that, our acquisition criteria, I'm going to take another step back. When we first bought deals, and this was like the tail end of when I came in. So this was like late 2015, early 2016. John and Don started the company. They, we bought three deals in the Carolinas with 10 and 12 year debt. And that was like the plan. We love the Carolinas, whatever, but cap rates just came down crazy. So what we said was, we're going to go a little bit more opportunistic and we're going to buy basically any good deal in a decent market that has really good risk adjusted returns in our opinion for that area anywhere on the east coast except you know take east side of the country excuse me so split the country in half except for like the far north texas and the northeast because we so kind of like a circle of like you know florida georgia alabama louisiana Tennessee up, you know, into the Midwest of like Indiana and Kansas and stuff like that. And then come across like Pennsylvania and down. Um, and we did, you know, we bought deals in Mobile. We bought deals in Jackson, Mississippi. We did a ground up in Clarksville, Tennessee. Um, where else did we do? We did it, you know, we started doing deals in Florida. Um, so we got, and we had deals in the Carolinas and just what started happening was we just started getting too spread out. And as we start having these conversations of like, Hey, I don't think we can continue to do this. Like we don't have enough scale yet to be in these many areas. We went under contract for these two properties down in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, what we thought were very good deals at the time, just continued to get worse and worse and worse as we went through due diligence. And then as our money went hard and through closing, and one of the reasons we decided to do it was, uh, Don and a couple close of his friends had a good chunk of change in 1031 money they were going to put into those deals. Mm-hmm. And what happened was right as that happened, we were saying, hey, like we had bought our second deal in Jacksonville, Florida. We had bought our first deal in Columbus, Ohio. And we said, we're going to focus on those two areas and surrounding markets. So we only focus on five cities in the Midwest. Some people don't consider it the Midwest and North and Central Florida. And what happened was we had four at the time, we only bought three deals come up in Florida that we loved, that we just fell in love with. Two of them were, three of them were managed by our property manager already. One was another one we were going under contract on and these deals in Alabama just kept kept getting worse and worse. And we just kind of looked at ourselves and said, you know, why are we even buying these? And we basically just did a cost analysis and said, is it better to give up the 500,000 and buy these or is it better to close on these and try to raise extra, you know, maybe we can't do all four. Maybe we can only do two, you know, like the two smaller ones or whatever. Cause it was a lot of money. I mean, it was, yeah, it's it was a, like, it's, it's a lot of effing money. <laughs> yeah. Th- those, de- those four deals were like 60 million or more. So it was like 20 million in equity at the time. Um, it ended up only being like 15 cause we, we dropped out of one. Um, and I think, the 1031 money was like 40% of that. Um, and we just, you know, they ultimately decided, not me, I don't want to say we, it's not like it was my money at the time um, or ever. Um, but they said, yeah, we're just going to walk. These deals aren't where we want to be going forward. We want to be in these two areas. We don't want to be in Montgomery. The deals aren't what we thought they were going to be. And, you know, we're just going to strategically decide to lose that and go buy these and, you know, we'll recover over the next five years. What is it, what is it like to be, I mean, I lost a bunch of money last year for the first time in real estate and you know, whatever, it's not nothing, 500,000, but, uh, 25 grand, something like that. But, um, what is it like to be in those conversations to have the discipline Mm -hmm. to see the bigger picture? Because I I really don't think 
there's a lot of people that would walk away from 500 grand. I mean, no. That is, so it's a little tough for me because I'm not a partner yeah, at yeah, Toro. Yeah. So I didn't lose $500,000, but I did lose out on, you know, income because I get, you know, I get paid both a small base salary and commission for when we buy deals and when we sell deals, assuming when we sell, we make money um, and the company makes money. Um, so, you know, I didn't really get hurt besides, you know, not closing on all six deals. We only closed on three of the six cause we mm-hmm. walked on those two and walked on the one in Florida. Um, but watching it, I mean, yeah, it's, it's tough. I mean, you're talking about losing a significant chunk of change, um, on the idea that, Hey, this is just the, this is just the right call. Like this is the right thing to do. Um, no, it's definitely hard. I can speak a little bit better to, um, when, after we bought that 82 unit deal in Jacksonville, Florida, which was not a Toro deal, it was a general partnership deal. We were actually going to buy another 86 unit in Jacksonville as well, that I was going to be a part of the general partnership of that we walked on right before due diligence. Um, we didn't lose our deposit, but you know, people don't realize just because you don't lose your deposit doesn't mean you don't lose money. We lost Mm -hmm. about between the four of us or five of us, I think again, like 30, 35 grand or something like that between legal accounting, travel lender, uh, et cetera. Um, and that, you know, it's not easy to walk away from deal and it's even tougher now because that deal crushed it after we walked because we know the person who bought it, our managers managing it for him. And they were thinking about selling it prior to this, but we looked at, we got hold of the financials when they were thinking about selling it. And I mean, they're cash flowing like a motherfucker, like Mm -hmm. it's crazy. So, um, I can talk more to that, but yeah, I mean, for five, I mean, it was, it's the same conversation. It's just, you know, what, what resources do you have? So if you don't have, you know, several million dollars, $500,000 sounds like a lot. Um, but it, yeah, it's not easy. It's really just, what do you value more? You know, do you value yeah. closing the deal and not losing money and maybe not making the best decision? Or do you take a step back and say, yeah, this is going to hurt today but we can survive it. And this is the right decision, not only for our own money, but for other people's money as well that we're raising. So, um, yeah, I mean, that was an interesting period to be a part of. It definitely hurt our ability to do as much business as we could in the short term, because obviously ton of lost revenue. Um, but you know, we're still here. We're still kicking. So it is thousand, what it is. Thousand percent. And one of my things is I, is I venture into the multifamily space for myself and hang out with a lot of multifamily guys. I just like hanging out with the, the bigger mindset and the, the bigger vision. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things I can't stand in the multifamily space is that, you know, they, they might own a percentage of a percentage of a percentage of a deal. And then they walk around and tell everybody they got 4,000 units and they're not making shit. And so, mm-hmm. and then you have people like, Tyler Chester, who owns a 50 unit by himself, like that's way better than probably your thousand units that you own a percent. So like I get sick of people like putting numbers on things. And like, I think goals are like kind of for somebody else, like intentional, likewise, like when you walk into a deal, like, you know, like it matters, like how much money you're actually making, right? Not just to purchase the unit, right? To say you have, so you bought an 82 unit, right? And as a company, I would imagine the discipline on the numbers, you know, there's a lot of egos flying around. There's a lot of emotions, but ultimately it just comes down to what the deal looks like, right? When you're, when you're buying a, any, any unit, a single family, a multifamily Mm -hmm. or any commercial space. Yeah. I think you made two really good points and I'll extrapolate more on the the decision-making for that 86 unit because I think it'll be interesting, but yeah, I mean with, you know, online presence and stuff, you know, people can easily boast. It's, you know, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Right. So for me, I do like to put out what the company has purchased and done on both a dollars and a unit count because it's my experience. I don't talk about 10 unit properties much because I have very little experience in that. I can take some from what I know and put it in. I don't talk about flips. I don't talk about wholesaling. Like I stay in my lane and that's Hey, here's what happens on, you know, 60, 80, 100, 300 unit properties. And you can take that information and do with it what you can. And, you know, a lot of it is transferable to other things. 
um, smaller multifamily, more mobile home parks, more self storage, not as much, but you know, the syndication side of it, you know, you could do that for anything you can do it, you know, raising money from people, you can do it for multifamily, any sort of real estate. You can do it for a business. You can do it for an idea. Um, you know, you can take all that stuff and apply it to other things. So it's very easy to hyper inflate what you've actually done. Um, and it's very, also very hard to portray the full story to people. Um, because you're looking at, you know, when you're on social media or you're on the internet and you're looking at somebody, you know, unless you spend hours listening to them talk, uh, unless you really take the time to dig in, you're getting a snapshot of their life and how they portray it. And you're going to make your own assumptions based on what they put on paper or in a video. And you're ultimately going to be wrong. Like nobody knows me as much as I do, um, online stuff and things like that. And same thing for you. So, you know, ultimately you just got to take what people put out there with a grain of salt and just extrapolate what you think is important from it and take on board what you think is important and don't, you know, don't get too hyped up by what people are saying they're doing and actually doing and yeah. things like that. Because at the end of the day, you know, there's going to be a lot of people that have been on paper doing really, really well, and they're <laughs> going to get caught up in something they weren't supposed to be doing. So, um, you know, we heard about, um, you know, somebody that thought they were going to have to sell two deals because they had a margin call for stocks. Um, I don't know if it was legal or illegal, but still not a good situation. It happened, being. Ha- happened to my friend. Yeah. So, um, he had to liquidate so, like half of his assets. Yeah. Those things happen, right? You over leverage shit hits the fan and that's what happens. Um, but you also were asking about, you know, the, the mindset of like buying a deal and, you know, as things come up, um, you know, every deal, basically when you're looking at a deal, you're trying to do everything in your power to find a reason not to buy it. At least that's how we look at it. Mm -hmm. It's I get a deal. Why shouldn't I buy this? And if I can't find any good reason not to buy it, I'm probably going to buy it. Um, We kind of work in the inverse, not why should I, it's why shouldn't I? Um, Too many people I think focus on why should I, and they tend to, you know, push here and push there. And once you push in several different areas, Well, now the whole thing's a little bit higher um, than what maybe it actually should be or you would feel comfortable doing. So we try to beat it down more so um, than anything else. Sorry. Um, But yeah, when we were under contract on that 86 unit property, um, it was a really interesting opportunity. It was a guy that had bought it out of receivership. He had gotten it occupied. Uh, It was 100% vacant, spent a ton of money, got it occupied and tenants had moved in for about like nine to 12 months. So it was like coming up on that renewal period for the first tenants. And we had a big problem getting information on the actual leases from the current owner. So we couldn't verify a lot of people's credit. We couldn't verify a lot of people's income. And we just didn't feel comfortable with what was going on. So the conversation we started having was, okay, here's the deal with what the information we were being told and every deal has a certain amount of risk and a certain amount of return. The return hasn't really changed, but now the risk has gotten higher because if we go in and we find out every single tenant has a credit score of 200 and, you know, instead of a three X multiple on their rent to income ratio, it's a two and a half or a two. That's just extra risk involved with the deal. Do we think it's worth it? So we started running, scenarios of what would happen if occupancy dropped and things like that. And it was, I mean, we went right up until, you know, the 24th hour before our money went hard of what we were going to do. And ultimately we just said, this isn't worth it because we were still newer at the time. Um, you know, this was within the first year that I'd moved to Toro. Um, you know, we didn't do, you know, millions and millions of dollars worth of deals. And we said, you know, this is something that's staring us in the face that could easily burn us and we're, we're taking an extra risk without, you know, additional upside. So we just said, no, nah, screw it. We're out. You know, we think this is, we think this is probably still a good deal. So d- if I had the money, I would have still bought it myself because mm-hmm. I was pretty confident that even if in the short term there was a problem, we would have done fine in the long term. Um, but it's a different beast altogether when you have money from other investors and other people involved in the deal. So 
we decided to walk. Like I said, I think we lost like 20, 30, 40 grand or something like that mm-hmm. for costs. I forget. And yeah, somebody else bought it. Our manager in Jacksonville manages it and they've crushed it. And that's a yeah. deal we could have made a ton of money on and didn't we lost money. So one of the, one of the guys I follow that I really enjoy, his name is Aaron Wagner. He's a big commercial mm-hmm. developer in Utah, private equity fund, the whole thing. He said that he went out and he interviewed um, all the rich families in America, like the Rockefellers, all mm-hmm. of them. And one of the greatest things I heard was the only family in the fourth generation that was still making money was the Rockefellers. Mm. And he asked the grandson, you know, what did your granddad tell you that, you know, that, that, that y'all keep making money? And he says to sell early and keep momentum. Like, and and I thought that was the greatest thing because I think momentum and and just like making the right choices and not getting yourself in this like massive hole and over leveraged, you know, everybody wants to get to where they're going so fast. And it's like, if you just build on small wins, right. And like, Mm. like, then, then the, I think momentum is a secret weapon and, and, and unlikability. I think to do a deal with somebody and it's, it's, it's a good deal and you feel good. Like I just want to do business with people that I enjoy hanging out with. And my mentors are doing massive stuff and they're crazy, but they're so fun to hang out with. And, and I think people don't talk about that enough. And when you take a 35 grand loss, yeah, it could really dial you down. But also there's probably a part of you that feels great that you feel like you've made a decision and it's not about the money, right? Like when you make that decision, it's a, it's a business decision and you're extrapolating emotion out of it. And when you can get to that point, I would imagine that it was the launching pad to how y'all have gained so many units in such a short period of time. So to, to a certain degree, yes, to a certain degree, no, um, because that was on the side and it wasn't part of Toro you know, I really don't talk about it much to be perfectly honest. Um, I I sometimes forget we didn't even do the property. Um, until, until, until they started talking about selling, I was like, I I forgot we didn't do that And then you had to look at it. And then the funny thing is when they started talking about selling, we were like, wow, they're going to sell for that much. We went back and we're like, where did we even have that under contract? We went back and I swear to God, I just wanted to go home and cry. Uh, (laughs) Like, I think it was something like we had under contract for like 55 a door the seller ended up buying it for like 57 50. I mean the, the new buyer ended up buying it higher at like 57 58 and they were wanting like high eighties to sell it in like two and a half years. And we were just like, Oh my God. Um, now keep in mind, you're not all in for that 57 number yeah, you're yeah, all yeah. in the sixties yeah, yeah. cause CapEx closing cost fees, et cetera. Um, but still we were like, God damn it. We could have had two 80 unit properties in Jacksonville that would have just absolutely crushed it. We just sold the 82 unit. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we absolutely crushed. I mean, we had a, you know, two and a half years, it's like a 22 IRR net to investors, you know, the, all the general partners made really good money. So sure. um, everyone's going to walk away with that, you know, very happy. Um, and that would have just been a like for like deal. Um, who knows if we would have sold it, obviously, um, you know, it was six months later. So we may have not have been in a position to sell. Who knows, right? In my head, it went exactly the same mm-hmm. and I would have made double the money. But sure. Um, but yeah, I think it was just, uh, you know, we cared about our reputation and I'm not going to sit here and say, we didn't talk about like, Hey, if we walk from a deal and lose money, we can tell people that and people will respect us. Like, yeah, that's, you know, like let's call a spade a spade. Like that's part of the emotional side too. You're like, Hey, how can we turn this into a positive as well? Like, I'm not going to sit here and be like, Oh, you know, we're just saints. Like we do everything for other people. Like we do it for selfish reasons too. Um, so and like, I but respect you also, even more. I respect you even more for saying it because it's, yeah, but I mean like th- going back to the social stuff, like, come on, if you're sitting on the other side and you're listening to this and you're not thinking, wow, that motherfucker didn't do it for selfish reasons to market himself. You, come on. Like, you know, I, I'm not going to try to bullshit it. What's clearly obvious, but yeah. that was only part of the decision. Like I didn't, I didn't lose money just so I could have the marketing for it. Like, yeah. I didn't, but, I didn't, but, I didn't lose $30,000 and no, make 120 off of it. No, right? but, like, here's, I didn't see but, it. but here's what you did. And here's, I'm going to slide into coaching mode for a second. Sure. Go for but it. Here's what you did is that you decided to, how you were going to perceive it. And that's yeah. the fucking game changer. When yeah. you, when you make a choice, cause life is a choice. When you make a choice on how you're going to perceive it, dude, of course you didn't say, Hey, let's go lose 40 K and we can market <laughs> off of that. that that's be the dumbest marketing plan on the, I'm not a marketing agent. And I would go, no, I don't think that's great. Yeah. <laughs> but instead of playing the victim and yeah. crawling in bed, you said, no, how we can, how can we flip this and, yeah. and then we'll be better for it. And by the way, 
my rule about two years ago was I only hang out with people from New York. I, I fucking love it. <laughs> I mean, they just, I can't stand all the tippy toe BS. I can't stand it. Cause I'm, I don't I'm have, so stupid too. I don't have time of that. I don't have time for that shit. I'm so busy. Like I, I don't have time for that. I'm trying to get to my goals and all that stuff. What's something as I'm interviewing you, something that strikes me interesting because I'm not this way. I'm very high energy. I'm crazy like literally i'll probably have like 100 businesses when this is over i just mm -hmm. love building businesses and hiring people and leading people you're very cerebral but i can tell there's there's a there's a there's a fire deep mm -hmm. down inside so do you show that a lot are you pretty disciplined in your daily routine do you get excited a lot or are you kind of like you kind of let your results what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to be more like you where mm. I let my results speak for me instead of my mouth, which my mouth yeah. talks a lot, you know? I think, and I, I hope I'm interpreting it right because mm. cerebral is not a word a lot of people use and I'm not a walking dictionary, but, I, you know, I'm definitely more of a laid back person. I'm not like a, a super, I'm not going to be in your face jumping and screaming. I'm not the biggest extrovert in the world. I'm definitely more introverted. Like, I know for sure I've been cooped up alone for two and a half months and I'm probably doing better than most people on my own, like. I'm okay with that. I'm I'm okay with myself. I'm okay with who I am and what I think and do. I'm definitely a, you know, actions speak louder than words. And yeah, you may jump and scream today, but you know, we'll see what happens in six, 12 months or six and 12 years. Sure. Um, you know, I am trying to be more outspoken about things, you know, I know, and I know can help other people. Like I, I try very hard not to like, step outside my lane. Um, mm -hmm. you know, like when, you know, just even, even when we were talking about the Montgomery deals, it's, I wasn't a hundred percent comfortable talking about it cause it's, yeah. it's not my money. Like it's not, 100%. it wasn't my decision, but I was there so I can share a little bit. Um, so I really try to just like stick to what I know. And, you know, as you know, I'm still young too. I'm only 28. I've only been doing this four years, give or take. And the first year and a half, I probably sucked royally at my job. I know the first six months I definitely did. So, you know, I, I try to just keep that in context, but yeah, I'm definitely not a, you know, jump and shout in your face. But you're comfortable with sucking because you know that you'll put in the work to get higher. Right. And yeah. And I just know over time it's going to pay out thousand percent. And, and like my mentor always says, my favorite line is make sure that your video matches your audio. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's the truth. I mean, there are a lot of people out there doing deals that I know that are doing, you know, 600 million a year and you've never even heard of them. Like, yeah. cause they don't need to talk. And, you know, for me, what I've done is as I've got older and, and worked on myself and done interesting, deep, deep, nasty work, I, I was homeless. I had a drug addiction, uh, alcoholism for 25 mm -hmm. years. I just got, so I've been sober for a year and four months, awesome. lost 50 pounds, you know, all these things. Right. Um, I think you're of the same with me. There's limiting beliefs on your message. Mm -hmm. But then you, I think when you switch it and you say like, it's not about me, like I'm just trying to help like anybody, I think that the freedom of the art expression can, you know, go a little, you know, you can't control it. Like just let it be what it is. Right. Yeah. I think, I think what changed for me is I had always thought about doing more and being out there more and in front of people and speaking for years, you know, ever since. I really got into it and as social media kind of rose and podcasting rose and all that stuff. Um, what held me back for a long time was it, it's like the imposter syndrome that a lot of people talk about. I still have it today. I feel like, you know, why the hell does anybody even listen to me? Um, mm -hmm. 20 year old kid that works a job basically. Um, but I started realizing that it, what really started hitting me, my dad is very intelligent, picks things up quick and is very good at researching and finding things out. And not to say that my mom wasn't, but he had not been involved in any of the real estate stuff. So he really had very little knowledge in how it worked. My mom had more knowledge, but the, the contrast that really hit me was when I was able to start having conversations with him and teaching him things, I was like, okay, like I have the ability to actually communicate and teach things to other people, even though I don't feel like I even fully know what I'm doing. And it was just that ability of like, yeah, maybe I'm at level two of a hundred or two of a thousand, but there's somebody that's at level one. Or if I'm at five of 10, there's somebody that's at level three. And if I can 
help them get up to you know my level, even though I've got so many more to go, you know, that's worth in my book. And, you know, it's just going to help them along the way. The other part too, that, you know, the other selfish aspect of it is you've got to know what the hell you're talking about to be able to teach other people. Mm -hmm. So it helps me shore up everything I know. And I have to do a lot of research and talking about things and making sure I understand. And it forces me to, you know, I can get by and get deals done with like our debt guys and our insurance guys because they're going to do 90% of the work. But if somebody asks me a question, I've got to actually kind of understand more what's going on than what I necessarily need to be able to answer some of those questions. And I'm not always going to be able to answer those questions because, you know, there's a limit on how much I need to know and want to know about the debt world and the insurance world and things of that nature. But it does make you kind of shore up some of those weaknesses in your foundation and, you know, those gaps in your knowledge and help you become better and more educated and things like that. So a thousand percent. And it's when I got started in real estate, I thought I wanted like 2000 single family houses. I was like, I'm going to be the biggest single family, like fuck all this shit. Like, ah, and then I realized like, I don't want any of those things. I was doing that for somebody else, you know, um, for, for my dad or whatever you want to call it. Um, but what I did realize is what I do want to do is I want to show people there's another way. And Mm -hmm. meaning if that's two Airbnbs or that's, you know, a six unit, right. That allows you to take that extra two vacations with your family. Um, you know, I, I provide, I think experiences over everything is my thing. Like I'm Mm -hmm. obsessed with traveling. We went to Europe for eight weeks on a one way ticket. Like it's just what I want. It's just what I want to do. Right. And, and so if you can give people that gift, right. And, and and like, I know it's cliche. I don't give a shit because you're not allowed to work with me. You're not allowed to work for me. You're not allowed to anywhere with me in the investing world if you haven't read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And, and basically, mm-hmm. I got handed the book at 17 from a friend's dad. He said, you're different. I can tell you hate school. Read this. <laughs> It'll change your life. And it took me seven years to implement it, but it did. And all that book is talking about is trading time for assets and liabilities. And, and basically, you're showing them. So like, what I'm realizing as I get deeper down the hole of my investing career is that I really don't want to do it. (laughs) Like Mm -hmm. I really just want to give money to y'all or like (laughs) Toro or like Evan or like my mentors and let me go coach. Like, let me go impact people because I've had a lot of crazy stuff happen to me and I'm better for it. And it's really finding clarity on your message. Right. And like, I think Chris is going to have multiple lifetimes. Right. I think Mm -hmm. Chris is going to, you know, you're only 28. I think, you know, in 32, that's going to look different than it was now. But but oh, what I appreciate what I appreciate about you and I and I see from your content is that you're willing to put in the work. That's mm-hmm. noted for sure. But also you're willing to not I love the fact, and I should I could take a little bit from you, that you're not willing to speak on shit that you don't know about. Like, look, bro, I don't know it. Like, but if you want to talk about this, I can talk about this. And and I think when you're authentic in your message, I think it comes across a, a lot more than just feeling like you have to be right all the time. Yeah, I think it, it's huge. It's I, I don't know how people talk about things they don't know. I, I just don't understand it. Like, especially now with everybody's talking about coronavirus and what's well, not as much anymore because people are just sick of it. I'm yeah. very happy we haven't really talked about it much. Yeah. But I make people I make people call it sunshine. I can't talk. I can't hear the I can't hear the fucking word anymore. I'm over it. Yeah, but it's there's so many people just talking out their ass and it's fun to do in like a private setting. Cause it's like, Oh, what do you think is going to happen? Well, I'm going to guess this because of this reason. And you know, you get, you know, you do get something out of it cause you try to extrapolate things and, you know, make guesses and see what happens. And, you know, you test theories and see what happens. That's how you learn. But so many people are trying to say, you know, this is what it is, or this is what it's not, or things like that. I'm just like, I, I just don't understand how you talk about things that you have no clue about it's like the parent at a soccer game trying to tell their kid what to do. Like just shut up, let the coach do their thing. If the coach sucks, it's not like you're better than them. So, you know, just deal with it. Like it's, that is funny. There's a, there's a really brilliant video of, uh, Lionel Messi and Luis Suarez and they're at their kid's soccer game (laughs) and they're just like, they're just chilling, like relaxed back so far. Now look, their kids are probably coached by, very, very World prominent class. Yeah. coaches and they have no coaching experience, but it's, 
it's just funny that those guys who probably know the game way better than you know any coach that's going to coach six year olds most likely that they're just going to sit back and hang out and you know let their kids do their thing and because they get it right they understand like yeah. this is this isn't my role it's I forget what it's called. It's like this, this something Kruger effect. I saw it the other day. It's yeah, like, I think I heard it too. Yeah. It's like on the, on the bottom axis, I always forget which one's axis, mm-hmm. but the bottom axis is like knowledge and that you actually have. And the other one's like how much you posture or like how much you say, you know, oh. and it's like, like the first like 10%, it's like people are super hot. Like when you know, absolutely nothing, you don't talk about it. When you learn very little, you talk a ton then you fall very quickly and you like slowly raise, but you're like never as high as the person that knows next to nothing. And uh, I thought that was very interesting. We got, I got to get that for, I got to put it on social media. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it makes a lot of sense, but yeah, I just, I just don't talk about things I don't know about one. Cause like, I don't want to look like a fool. And two, I don't want to steer somebody in the wrong direction either. Mm-hmm. Like I don't even talk, I don't talk about debt that much. Cause yeah. I don't really get it. Like yeah. I'm learning a ton about right now or trying to, like the secondary debt world and how it well, affects how we get loans and what happens. And it's, things. it's dude. It's so funny that you say that I worked for a private equity fund for a year and a half. I just got laid off like a month ago. Mm-hmm. It wasn't until I switched my learning to, I stopped learning about real estate and learned about money markets. It changed my mm-hmm. whole life because yeah. when you understand how the second, the, the money markets work, you can understand how debt leverage and how you can get a deal funded. It is amazing to know the inner workings of how, Black, you know, we sell, we've got 16 units or 21 doors, 16 houses we're trying to sell right now. And we will sell in like a month to a hedge fund just to know how they pr- approach a deal like that. And it, it just, a regular investor doesn't understand how a hedge fund buys a, uh, buys a portfolio because they're not looking at the numbers that you're looking at. So it's, it's very interesting. No, it, it's, it's very interesting. And I've actually, I'm not a big reader. I'm trying to force myself. I'm doing audio books now. Oh, I um, to yeah, I'm listening to Ray Dalio's book Principle right now. I'm about he, to start it on Saturday. It's it's very good. It's long though. It's definitely yeah, long. yeah. Well, I gotta um, drive from uh, Florida to DC, so we'll there pop you go. It so in. That'll, that'll be worth it. Um, but he he was talking about how like they view. He was talking. He talked one crazy thing about. Um, he was working with McDonald's when they were going to introduce the chicken McNugget back in like the 80s. And he was also working with the supplier for the chicken to make it. And neither one of them, McDonald's obviously wanted a fixed cost for chicken because they're going to have a fixed sale price. The chicken producer didn't want a fixed cost because they don't know what their costs are going to be. So they want a variable. And he said, we just like looked at the whole system and we found out that the only variable really between the price is the cost of feed for the chicken. They went all the way down the supply chain. He said, what we did was they basically put together some sort of a hedge for the cost of the feed and said, hey, with this hedge in place, your price will never go over X. It could actually drop lower. Because I'm sure what happened was it's like, if the price was, I have no idea what the fuck a price feed is, yeah. but let's say it was mm-hmm. two bucks. Mm-hmm. They probably said, with this hedge, we can maximize your cost at $2.30. So you can afford to sell it at whatever your markup is. You can afford to sell for three bucks to McDonald's. McDonald's can afford to buy for three and sell it for four as this chicken McNugget, whatever the hell it is. By looking at the whole system and finding out what the actual cog was that drove the pricing volatility in the machine. And I've been thinking that about that a lot lately. And I'm like, damn, like if you can just take a little bit of that approach to how this works, maybe you can kind of reverse engineer better leverage, better deals. Um, so that's partly why I was interested in the debt world beforehand and the mm-hmm. secondary market because it was a gap in my knowledge and it was sure. something I thought I can learn about and start incorporating as well as it also goes into macroeconomics, which has been crazy with everything that's going on and understanding. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't understand where it's, it's all ties together, but now I'm have going you, down a rabbit hole. No, you're, 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 I was hey, trying we'll, to understand. We'll, we'll, under- we'll, ha- we'll have another call because I could go down that rabbit hole with you yeah, right yeah. now too. I was trying to understand how the U.S. could afford to just pump all the stimulus money out and where well, yeah, it was I mean, going yeah. to come from. So I started going down that rabbit hole. I started going down the rabbit hole of secondary treasury world, secondary debt world. And then I started listening to this book and it's just been kind of coming full circle a little bit more. Yeah. And it's basically to your point, I think a big gap in my knowledge. And I think in a lot of people's just because 
most people probably don't find it interesting. And I'm not like super passionate about it, but I think it's important for me to get better at what I am passionate about, which is the real estate world. Mm -hmm. And that there's just a larger machine and we're just a small component of it. And I'm missing 70, 80, 90% of the rest of the machine that I don't fully understand yet. And it's actually a risk in part of the deals that I'm doing that I could minimize by understanding it better. Um, which is probably why these massive institutions can afford to pay less or well pay more lower cap rates because they can minimize the risk by doing different hedges, seeing the full machine, having money elsewhere, et cetera. Yeah. My financial advisor is 27 years old. He's out in Sacramento. He's a smartest guy I know. I mean, I've never met anybody like him. Uh, he manages their company totals like 9 billion. Uh, I think he manages like 1.5 personally. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's a money manager. And then my other buddy runs all the money for UT, which they have like 30 billion. And when you spend time with them, you, you, you understand that it's so much greater than you can even imagine. They're, they're buying trees in the Amazon to supply multifamily. Ha- I mean, th- you just don't even understand the depths of how these numbers secular go down and down and down. And what he's taught me is that this world is literally one big transaction. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when they're lending out money to you, it's, it's merely like they got the money at 6%. They're lending it to you for 9%. You're paying the points on the front end. So that's why they're getting their fee. And then they're giving their investors the 8%. It's just, it's like, you don't, it just keeps going and going and going. No. And I think that's been super apparent with, as everything basically came to a grinding halt, you really, it became very apparent how reliant on all those cogs we are that if one thing breaks down or multiple things break down, you know, there's a trickle effect to everything else. Mm -hmm. There was, and we haven't even, and we haven't even seen it yet. Like, because when you have an event, like what you have in like, okay, I'll just use what I know. Austin. Sure. South by Southwest brings in $400 million. Yep, Yep. 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 So what you don't understand guys is that the fucking city is going to have to find the money somewhere. And you know where that comes? Raising taxes. They're going to get their money. And so this is not, that one event getting canceled is a five-year problem. It's not, that's what people don't understand. Or it's just, you know, removing expenses. So things they would have spent that money on are going to get cut, whether it's, you know, other events, different public works, things like that. mm -hmm. You know, at least unless I'm wrong, but I mean, you can, no, I mean, you and we increase just increase your just, NOI okay. two different ways, yeah, either raising saying, extra income or lowering expenses. But no, it's a hundred percent. And I mean, it makes. I mean, you've just seen it over and over again. Different industries being affected that you wouldn't expect by things that are going on. Um, like I what mean, people don't talk about because I spent twenty years in the restaurant business, high end restaurants, bartending, chef. It's not the restaurant. Yeah, the restaurants are going to fail for sure. Forty mm-hmm. percent of restaurants are going to fail, guaranteed. Thirty, forty, whatever. Yeah. But you're not even looking at the secular effect of the chicken farmer, of the distribution company, of the lettuce farmer. Like, I mean, this, it goes but down. That, so that I don't know if everybody's seen it, but you've seen reports of like people throwing out tons of crops, basically just, they, they, well, that's what happened. That's what, so all my, all my buddies work in oil and gas, all of them. Mm-hmm. They're all either on the hedge fund side or they, or they're, they work for a bank. Do you want yeah. to know why we, do you want to know why we're having a problem with gas right now? It's sure. the stupidest yeah. reason in the world. We have nowhere Isn't to put the fucking gas. Yeah, yeah. Because nobody's been driving. They yeah, told me like, this two, they told like me the this two months ago. They said we don't have any we can't make oil. Yeah, it was like the future contracts went it was basically negative. So they were gonna pay people to storm if you actually took it, but not I mean they're like paying the ranchers to like st- I'm storm on their land. Like this is for That's, real, dude. Like they have no room. Like no, it's crazy. What a weird problem to have. Like <laughs> it's it's absolutely crazy. And what I think is, where was I going? You started down the one path and it went off and then yeah. you went back to gas yeah, oil. I, can't help I, I lost it. it. I can't help it. But, I'll, but it'll hit me. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, it's, you know, all the different things that are affected. It's just, it's mind blowing. Oh, where I was going to go with that is mm-hmm. when you were talking about 30, 40% of restaurants closing, mm-hmm. what people don't realize is they think there was X amount of capital in circulation before this happened. But now what's going to happen is people that had, you know, a million dollars on the sideline ready for real estate. Now they might take 200,000 to open up a business on the small side. Mm -hmm. So where everybody's thinking, oh, like where, where market's going to be in six to 12 months, there's not going to be as much capital. Mm -hmm. So people's valuation of properties coming out of this could be vastly lower than they think. Because the whole argument 
it was really interesting before this all happened as they started doing rate what was happening was they were doing the interest rate hikes for a couple years mm. and what we could borrow commercial loans at was going up and up and up cap rates weren't really following it as much so the spread was getting tighter and tighter between what you could borrow debt at and what cap rate you would buy at which if you don't understand how that produces cash flow yet go look it up or come talk to me and I'll explain yeah, it to you. Yeah. Um, but then what happened was obviously they started, they stopped and then they started doing hikes and debt started coming down and then cap rates started coming down. So they, a lot of like a lot of major markets like your Raleigh's, your Orlando's and stuff like that, you were seeing like 5% cap rates when interest rates were getting up into the high fours and 5% range. They just started coming down into low fours and high threes for like a few months or several months cap rates started coming way down into the fours. Yeah. And it was because people were, you know, lenders were still making, as the treasuries came down, they, the lenders were able to borrow at half a percent and lend it out at 3%. And mm -hmm. you could then buy something for a four and a half cap and make the spread over that. Like you were saying, everyone just borrows and takes a cut basically. Mm -hmm. um, but what happened was obviously when this hit, transaction volume fell off a cliff because the debt world got way riskier. Interest rates came back up, even though treasury stayed and a lot of lenders went away. You know, the U S had to step into the secondary market to start buying bonds because the um, originators that originated the loan, all of a sudden they became more risky once Corona hit yep. and there was no secondary market. So that's why the U S stepped in and started buying bonds. And from my understanding, again, I have very yeah, limited. No, so no, if you hear anything or somebody no, hears something, spot, wrong. no, you're spot on. And and so I want to tell you, cause I literally lived it. So I can, I can say firsthand, you know, and I, so I let, let me, yeah, let me go, just go finish ahead. my thought and yeah, then yeah, I'll yeah, let yeah, you go. Yeah. So what we're, oh, what a lot of people are talking about now is like, what's going to happen when the world opens back up, the treasury is probably not going to get hiked up right away. So where is lending going to be? Lending's probably going to be back in the high threes, low 4% range back where it was when interest rates, uh, cap rates came down to these crazy low 4% ranges mm -hmm. in these major markets, in these big properties, I'm not talking about your 10 unit in Tuscaloosa for an eight cap, right? Mm -hmm. Let's just, let's call it what it is. Um, so people are talking, well, you know, cap rates will come right back down. I'll be able to sell it for what I was, but there's not going to be as much capital around. So mm -hmm. if now all of a sudden I, as a buyer have less competition even though what would have sold for a four and a half cap because interest rates are 3% six months ago, I have more to choose from now and I have less competition. So naturally, if everything was exactly the same beforehand, there's just going to be less capital in circulation because other things are going to need it and there's going to be other opportunities. People are just going to naturally pay less on a cap rate basis for it. Assuming all that other trickle down stuff that you were talking about happens. Which Agreed. And, and, and the problem is, is because I lived it firsthand. The, the problem is not the, the first market, the, the traditional lending side. What people don't understand when you're inside the, the beast uh, and you're lending for new construction, development, um, mm -hmm. hard money was what, what we did. Um, the secondary markets are literally annihilated right now. I mean, like you're talking about, we went from doing nine to 11% to it's spiking to two points, one point to going to 13 to 17% at four and five points. Yeah. Right. And I actually talked to my old boss yesterday. I don't need to talk about who they are. I'm not going to, but they had a really bad month. And it, like, when I say bad, I mean like off a cliff, down a hill, through the woods, like laid off, you know, 40% of the staff. And this, they did that in the first week, bro. So like, is that, is that because of default? Risky Lynn, maybe they had a little too much leverage out. Uh, but what happened is, was we get, we get a lot of our capital from Blackstone and the bigger markets and they just stopped lending money gotcha. to secondary lenders. Right. And so the money just went away. And so we, if I'm understanding, uh, basically because a large part of the business revenue is coming from the generation of these loans once yep. that stopped the, the point the revenue stream right? for the yeah the yeah. revenue stream for the company significantly decreased or stopped so therefore it couldn't afford the payroll it could it couldn't afford the payroll gotcha. um 
And, and, but what you got to understand is, is this, this affects so many markets like flipping and, um, and all these things. And so for me, that's why we launched the wholesale company on Monday, because mm -hmm. for two reasons, it's, I think there's going to be a huge need for it in the next, uh, five years. We're going to do a lot of owner financing sub two deals, but also I just want to keep the front of my funnel full so I can pick and choose my deals when I see fit. Right. Um, and, and that's why we started it. And, you know, I, we have a great team and, you know, my business partner's a freaking assassin. He's 22 years old. He's been running a brokerage since he was 18. He's, he's, he's great. Right. And mm -hmm. I know nothing about wholesaling, <laughs> nothing, but I'm sure going to awesome. learn quick, you know? And so you, what I'm saying, the reason I'm telling people that is you have to look at the market from a granular five-year plan and go, what makes sense? And what Chris is saying is that like, it's the truth, bro. I went to the best conference ever and they were over syndicating deals. There was 17 offers on one multifamily, you know, all this stuff. So now as a multifamily investor moving forward over the next couple of years, those 17 people, it's, same, it's the same thing in the Airbnb space. 50% of my competition is gone. So if you can weather the storm, you're going to be able to buy a better deal. You're going to be able to move a little slower, make sure you pick the right deal, but you just got to keep your head on straight because you can't buy on emotion. Like you, what I try to tell young investors, it's the hardest thing for them to get it, wrap their brain around by you not buying a deal for the next two years. You might actually get ahead of everybody else. Yeah. That's true. Cause you can't, my, my, one of my mentors is a massive developer. They do billions of dollars. He said, you can't invest when the knife is falling directly at you. <laughs> like, <laughs> that makes sense. I mean, because the knife is falling. And, he, and here's the problem. So the market goes like this, right? You're falling, you're gap, and then you're up. The, mm -hmm. People don't lose their shit when the market's coming down. They lose their shit when it plateaus. What I'm saying, they can't hold on. Because gotcha. the rate, it's dropped so much, the money's got tight, the lending's mm -hmm. got tight, and they're over leveraged. They can make money on the down and the up, it's that plateau when it kicks before it kicks back up that, that just, that's to have people jumping off roofs. Yeah. If the, if the machine's not running. Yeah. Because, because we're getting ahead of ourselves. Everybody in life, they get ahead of themselves for everything. Oh, we'll just, we'll just put leverage on it. Like, uh, 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 like what if you, what if you bought a 50 unit and you paid for it cash, right? I'm just saying like, that's a hell of a deal instead of getting in a thousand unit and being, you know, doing it at 90%, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I personally, two, three years ago with Toro or eventually separating them myself was like, I want a billion dollar company that's, you know, syndicates money and, you know, we just own a ton of assets. I am really, I don't know if I, st I don't know yet, but I'm not as certain that that's what I would want. And I wouldn't want like a, either just own a bunch of stuff by myself or with a few partners or with family or just like a smaller medium shop. Mm -hmm. because you just have less headaches. And I think to your point earlier, people want to move too quick to get to where they are. I mean, it's a hundred percent. If you're willing to, you know, take 10 years to get to where you want to be, you know, you'll go get 65% debt instead of 90. If, you'll if go you're get building, 70 If you're building on legacy yeah. and not units, then who cares how fast you get there? Yeah. No, I mean, there's, there, there are so many people that have 20 units that know more than I do. There's so many people that know, you know, that own a hundred units that know more than I do because they've yeah. been doing it longer and they've seen way more than I have. They're also in the weeds more. Like I don't manage our properties. I, you know, I've never, I've never replaced cabinets. I barely like, that's another big flaw that I have that I don't really talk about. Like, I don't really know a lot. I'm learning cause I always ask and on due diligence, I'm always trying to be there when like the vendors are. But like the property, physical aspects of the property and like the stuff in it, I mean, I know next to nothing. Yeah. You know, like I'm, I know what I need to know to get a deal done because I rely on other people to do it because these properties support it. But I don't, you know, I've never replaced a cabinet before. You know, I've never fixed a boiler before. I've never fixed an AC condenser. You, you know, you bought a single family home and you, you know, ran it yourself for five years you know, a heck of a lot more than I do in that space in that regard. And then over the next 15 years, you scale up to hundred units. Now you got both sides of the coin. Yeah. You're in a way better position than me. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you're going to be better than me at the same point in life, because I think I'll probably work harder than a lot of people. But yeah, I mean, there's tons of people out there with a 
lower resume, lower experience, less units, less dollars on paper, you're better off listening to them than me. Yeah. And I selfishly want to continue this conversation for the next five hours, but uh, I need to respect his time. You, <laughs> you, you have somewhere to be. Uh, I want to respect your time. No, I appreciate it. No, this is, uh, this was good. Um, you know, I'm happy to share. And, yeah. Know, How do they, uh, uh, your, your social media stuff, your, your videos you're sharing are great. How do they get a hold of you? How do they uh, look at your stuff? You know, all that stuff. Yeah. So m- I'm most active on Instagram and LinkedIn um, at Chris.Grenzig on Instagram. Just search Chris Grenzig on LinkedIn. Um, we have our own podcast too called The Real Estate Investing Experience. You guys can find it on Fantastic every single podcast. platform. Yeah. You can go check it out. Uh, we also just launched a, a private Facebook group too, The Real Estate Investing Experience, where we're hoping to interact more with people because you don't get it as much, definitely from the podcasting side, but even mm-hmm. on social media, you don't really get that back and forth. Sure. Um, and it's not... It's not our usual content. We're not posting any of the videos and stuff. We're in there sharing ideas, thoughts, stuff like that. So a little bit of a different aspect we're trying out, seeing if it works. Um, you can also email me, chris at tororep.com. And you know, you hit me up anywhere. I usually get back to people within 24 hours, if not 48. Perfect. I actually, uh, if it still goes on, I have an Ironman in July 18th in New York. So I'll have to take a day and swing through the office. Um, yeah. if, if we're in the office, we'll see. Well, either way, but it's out, <laughs> it's actually out way West. I don't even know where it's at. So I just signed up for it cause my buddy told me to, so whatever, but, uh, no, definitely hit me up if it's yeah. close enough, you know, well, I'm in, I'll be in my car, so I'll just go wherever, but dude, thank you so much, man. If y'all enjoyed this, probably one of my favorite episodes, so much detail, so many things to talk about. Definitely going to bring Kish back later on and do another one. So thank you so much, buddy. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for listening to Construct Your Life with Austin Lenny. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to start constructing your life by taking immediate action on what you learned. For show notes, resources, and more information on -on one-on-one coaching with Austin, visit constructyourlifepodcast.com.